All right, we're about to start the next session on autonomous communities. So Larry and Stuart, come on stage and please join us. Uh, I'm Peter Hirschberg, and I'm one of the uh, co-authors of the book From Bitcoin to Burning Man and Beyond, which is kind of a set of foundational essays on this topic of how do we build autonomous systems and autonomous communities. And today's conversation is going to be amazing because we're actually going to get into the meat of how do you build autonomous communities in the real world and, well, how might that be instantiated in code? Um, and, you know, I was thinking, if you really wanted to understand these things, and if you really wanted to understand, okay, we're going to go into a world with self-executing contracts and kind of self-executing governance systems, you'd want to run an experiment ahead of time to understand all of this. So what might you use as your laboratory? Well, if you really wanted to understand this in 2015 and you were prescient, I mean, like you were really clever, you might have thought that a good thing to have done would have been to start an experiment 29 years ago in 1986 when the microprocessor was young, an experiment that you could run for 30 years to find out. Now, to run this experiment, here's what you'd want to do. I mean, just hypothetically, you'd want to take some of the smartest, most thoughtful people you ever knew of, and some artists, and even a philosophy which itself was based on a radical notion of autonomous zones. Okay, and follow me here. You'd want to take all of this and, and, and bring it up to some remote location, because what we're trying to do is push the boundaries and run a social experiment so we could come back to 2015 and understand how we might put this all in code. Now, in running this hypothetical experiment, we'd want to send these people into the middle of nowhere where there's absolutely nothing, because, and, and this is the good part of the experiment, we'd want to make everything up, like all the rules and how we organize, what the place looks like, what we'd wear, everything, because follow me here, to pull this thing off, we want to create on a place that is the closest on Mars to any place on Earth, the most thriving self-organizing community we could think of, just so we could report back in 2015 for people who want to build this stuff into code. Now, of course, for this experiment to be really remarkable, we'd also need to report back to 2015 on... Uh, because don't forget, in 2015, people are reimagining the economy and wealth and, 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 and our currency. We'd want to report back to them uh, uh, the principles of what a new economy might look like. We'd want to relax the constraints of the branded giant supply chain to see how people might create and express themselves and add value in this hypothetical world. And this would be really cool because we'd also want to build a generative system that, that actually worked and, and jumped the, the, the firewall and spread its culture worldwide. Well, of course, the remarkable thing is this hypothetical experiment actually exists. It's Burning Man, and we're thrilled today to have in the panel joining us Larry Harvey, who's the founder of Burning Man, Stuart Magnum, who leads its global education effort uh, for that community, and my dear friend Jen Sander, who's kind of Burning Man's ambassador plenipotentiary. She works with its communities worldwide. And then joining us after we hear about this is going to be myself and Michaela Wairo, because as she writes about Holonic systems, that really is the theory that underlines how might communities organize and express themselves and what can we learn, because of course everybody else in this room is at work in actually trying to express this in code to make a different world. So I'm thrilled to turn it over to you, Jen, and to the team from Burning Man that has been conducting the experiment that we have been looking for for 30 years so we might get on with our work. Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. We're delighted to be here and to be part of this discussion of governments and autonomy. Um, these are questions that Larry and Stuart have been thinking about since Burning Man started in 1986. I'm, I'm Jen Sander, as, uh, as um, Peter said, and I work on Burning Man's nonprofit on their global initiatives team. Um, and uh, we're exploring how our culture is manifesting into the real world now and how it's manifesting into cities and other organizations. But I'd like to start with a show of hands. How many of you have actually been to Burning Man before? Oh, wow. That's a fair number. I guess you were in the Bay Area. So um, so for the rest of you, you can see by this picture up here the sort of scale of that Burning Man has become, and it truly has become a pop-up city. I've got a little video clip for you to see as well. Um, this may demonstrate how it's been growing in sort of all the different types of art and community that we have. In 2013, we had a peak attendance of 70,000 participants in over 600 pieces of art, including mutant vehicles, 
which are a form of artistic expression as well as public transport. So I think that kind of demonstrates the conversation that we're going to have later with Peter and Michaela about uh, individual artistic expression and the communal effort as well. So Larry, sitting over there, is the founder of Burning Man, and he was the author of The Ten Principles. And Stuart, sitting next to me, um, has been working with Burning Man for how long? Since 1993. Since 1993. Yeah. And is the director of education. Um, and you've been burning is that, that long as well? With a, took a few years off here and there, but yeah, more or less. Right, and you actually were one of the founding members of the Cacophony Society as well. That's true. Right, so the Cacophony Society was sort of like a guerrilla theatrical community that was distributed um, via a publicly uh, communicated newsletter um, that were the first people to actually explore the autonomous zone of the Black Rock Desert. So Stuart, I'd love to hear from you about autonomous communities um, and sort of how the, they kind of came about and how we, we got involved with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, when Burning Man first started in 1986, 86, it was literally two guys and a hammer who knocked together an eight-foot uh, figure and uh, we're looking for a place to burn it. So uh, where do you go to burn an eight-foot figure without the hassles of getting a permit? Perhaps you drag it down to your local beach. Beaches have always been kind of liminal spaces in California history, uh, a little bit more tolerant of, of odd behavior, like, for instance, taking your clothes off or having a beach bonfire. Uh, so for the first few years, the event was conducted on, uh, on Baker Beach in San Francisco uh, until, inevitably, a few years later, when the man had reached 40 feet in height and the crowd had reached hundreds of people in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in attendance, um, it attracted a little too much attention from local law enforcement. And the, the burn was actually shut down in 1990. Um, now, as Jen said, I was a member of the San Francisco Cacophony Society. Uh, this event had been on our radar for quite a while. We were very interested in it. Um, the Cacophony Society had a long history of, let's say, appropriating or repurposing public spaces or quasi-public spaces in interesting ways, um, ranging from, say, having a, turning a BART train car into a karaoke lounge or turning the uh, elevator in a public parking structure into a stage for a one-act play, uh, lots of interesting ways of, 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 of appropriating space. Uh, that included uh, detouring billboards and altering the messages on them. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the sister organization of uh, Cacophony was called the Billboard Liberation Front. We'll talk about them in, a, in another session. I think, some of, those, I think there's, some of those indictments are still sealed. Yes. <laughs> so, Larry, what happened as a result of this? Can you tell us a bit about the evolution of Burning Man? Well, y yes, but first, jumping on what Stuart said, uh, there was a, uh, things seldom happen. Uh, Sui generous, uh, uh, there's an even deeper background. San Francisco long been the, the site of a lot of Bohemian culture in America. This not only goes back to the beats, uh, but uh, includes uh, the, the inception of San Francisco. It was a lot of uh, 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 get rich quick, putative gold miners. Uh, who came to San Francisco thinking that they could change their lives and reinvent things anew and get lucky. And uh, uh, that spirit's perhaps faded a little bit, although I'll note that uh, on the way over in the boats, uh, most of them, very few people went the overland route. They, they routed around uh, uh, by ship. And uh, by the time they reached San Francisco, virtually all of them had nicknames. And uh, which was a spontaneous impulse among them that they were inventing a new identity. And, and of course, that happens in the Black Rock Desert. Nobody ever told themselves to give themselves playa names, but virtually everyone does except me. Um, and uh, I've avoided that. Uh, so, it, 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 what happened once we got there? Well, we, we encountered a, 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 an earthly void. Uh, so more nothing than anyone had, that any of us had ever seen. Uh, uh, a flat plain uh, uh, made up entirely of uh, alkaline sediments, the 
the relic of, a, of an ancient uh, lake system rivaling the Great Lakes in its, uh, in its, in its day. And, um, uh, and, and out of nothing came everything. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we, the, the, some who would come out were subscribed to uh, the notion that this was sort of a piratic playground, and and a fellow wrote a book called uh, 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 what the hell is that book called? Uh, Hakim uh, Temporary it, Autonomous it, Zones it, it, by Hakim Bay. That's his pen name, and and uh, and so they thought, well, you can do anything here, and in in, in sense that what, what was absolutely true, except in doing anything you had to confront. Uh, uh, it, it, everything that's, that, that, as we grew into a city, you had to create the, the entire repertory of, of civilized action. Uh, we, 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 ended up, we ended up being the government of the city, and it took go oh, until about 1996 for, for certain key questions, such as it might have been dear to the heart of John Locke, uh, to get answered. And, uh, 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 what had happened is in, in the name of a, a radical autonomy, it, it, we, what we created is, is something like, um, we created a gold rush town and uh, that had exp expanded, uh, that, that it had uh, it spread out in random fashion. So it looked like a very aggravated version of Los Angeles and uh, a space in, within which cars were driving without their lights on at reckless speeds, bullets were being shot in various directions. And, uh, and uh, it, it was at that point that, that, that w w we, we had started. I think you had been involved in, in putting little signs out at the, at, the, at the boundaries of the city coming in that were like the signs you see by the Kiwanis and so forth when you enter a little town. Well, back before we were a real city, we were kind of playing at the notion of being a city with a city limits sign and fake service clubs and all that. Yeah, it, but, that was done in jest, but then suddenly it dawned on us we were the government. And we invited, as it turned out, everyone said, well, don't tell anybody. We'll keep it secret and therefore cool. But, but, but all the hipsters were so addicted to bragging about how cool they were that, that, that there was no, and this was before the internet, but it spread like wildfire in underground circles and beyond them in half no time. And uh, so now we were responsible, oh, by 96 for uh, 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 10,000 people. And, uh, and that was partly fueled by the uh, very early stages of the, uh, the internet, actually. Um, we started publicizing the event before the first commercial web browser. We had a uh, chat group on The Well. Anybody here remember The Well? Heard of it? Read about it in your history books? Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> well, before there was a browser, before you got pictures on your internet, you could type in chat. Anyway, and that led to uh, the first <laughs> websites. Uh, and, and our community actually very uh, gravitated to that, and it was very much accelerated by that. Uh, we went from, you know, as Larry said, we went from a, a few hundred people to eight or ten thousand people in a super short period of time. Uh, and, and as a result of that experience, uh, uh, what, 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 it, it, there came a collision between the notion of, of, of civic responsibility and the notion of anything goes, and it turned out in the world of anything goes, politics actually became gang rule. And, uh, and, and factions would form and you'd back one, pretty much the way you keep the order in a federal penitentiary. Although it looked free, it wasn't. It wasn't responsible and, and, and finally in that chaotic environment, lives were in danger so we created civic boundaries, we created some fundamental simple rules, we, we eliminated the automobile from uh, uh, the equation by making people camp at their, web, at their camps or anchor their cars to their campsites. And uh, oh, and we banned guns while we were at it. And uh, which is just is inherently responsible to shoot down range uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an empty space that's subject to mirages and dust storms. Oh, it's the guns thing again. Yes, it's the guns thing. Well, I, let me be clear. One of the reasons that uh, this space was on our map in the Cacophony Society was specifically as a place to go shooting and not really attract a lot of attention. Uh, not, clo not far from where Black Rock City exists now, uh, a pretty legendary uh, event was held called the Car Hunt. You can look this one up on the, uh, on the interwebs too, uh, where a team of machine artists converted an old station wagon into an armored uh, remote controlled target and we chased it down from chase vehicles and, and shot it to pieces. Um, so being off the radar was very much a part of why we chose this place. 
Um, the other side of it, though, and I just want to throw this in there, was sort of the experiential thing of being out in a liminal outsider space like that. Um, the Cacophony Society was very much an experiential organization. It was encoded into the mission statement at the top of every edition of Rough Draft was that we are a randomly gathered network of individuals united in pursuit of experiences beyond the mainstream. Um, and that notion of going to a place that's completely outside of context had a pretty magical effect on a lot of events, right? It, it, it spurred that, that notion of being in, a, in an elsewhere kind of a state. We actually came up with a, a, a term for that sort of event. We called them zone trips, uh, based loosely on the uh, Russian science fiction novels of the Strugatsky brothers, the uh, uh, roadside picnic, where an area can, can exist that's completely outside of normal civilization. And, and that's, that's what we were shooting for. And, and I think that, that led to a lot of some of the more interesting creative ideas that came out of the place in the well, early years. It, it was inspiring to be in a place where anything that is is more intensely so because there's nothing around it to contradict it. That's an artist's dream, a world entirely defined by vision. Uh, it, 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 but, but, but the fact on the ground was we had created this, 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 this cartoon of Los Angeles where nobody was particularly connected and when they were connected they were driving recklessly and shooting guns near one another and so so you can see from the image on the screen, what we did is we condensed it and we created densities, settlement densities that Americans are generally uh, a little uncomfortable with. There are many, it's like a kibbutz almost. And what that did is it, is it, 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 it in, the, in, the, in the frontier regime, uh, people, w w w it, it was difficult to connect and it was very chaotic and it was frankly dangerous. Uh, uh, suddenly, by condensing the settlement, the rate of social interactions multiplied. And the year we went to that plan, suddenly a new institution took off. It was called Theme Camp. It, it bears the, it, 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 it occupies the same niche approximately that retail shops would in, a, in, in, a, in an urban space, except nothing's for sale and, and those uh, camps, the theme camps, come and, and, uh, the, and device something of their own imagining and just give it to passersby and invite them into their camps. Suddenly, at densities like this, that began to happen at an enormous rate. Neighborhoods formed overnight. Uh, it was no longer, it was no longer people uh, 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 scattered out in, 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 into a, a formless place in, 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 in search of in, in search of uh, 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 autonomy, suddenly it became a place where social interaction formed, began to form the society in, in a coherent way and through which everyone could belong to the place, belong to one another while, while remaining uniquely themselves. And that's part of the formula that make, made Burning Man uh, from that point on, continue to grow ge at, at a very rapid rate until now, of course, it's its current size and is a cosmopolitan city, indeed an international city. When you look at the composition, we've got 20% from abroad. We've got uh, that, that, that percentage is only growing. It's an international place now. So I mentioned earlier now we're at 70,000 participants. What kind of effect has that had on the local community, um, government relations, and, and evolving partnerships with the government? Well, it was like the beach. For the first two years, uh, nobody even noticed we were there. It's, it's a big space. Actually, I actually have a great story about that. I was recently talking with a retired Nevada Highway Patrol state trooper um, who, in 1993, was sent out. He said his sergeant came to him and said, there's a bunch of hippies out there blowing shit up out on the Black Rock Desert. And he said, where? <laughs> he had to look it up on a map. He had to arrange for refueling. He got out there and he looked around and he didn't find anything. He was convinced that he was hoaxed until the same call came in the next year. By the way, he actually uh, consults with us now. He's retired. Anyway. The, the, the primary problem as we grew was, was finding our city. Uh, <laughs> It, it, we had no gate. We hadn't figured out how to create a fence. When we did create a gate, it was the gate. We sold tickets, but with, without walls, it was more or less a conceptual gate, like an art project. And, and uh, most people drove right by it. And uh, so that was not economically sustainable because we were beginning to build a real city. And uh, uh, during one shift, I remember somebody, what was collected? Oh. 
uh, $5 a sandwich and a joint. That was the tape for a four hour. That was our revenue line. That right was there. our revenue. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it, it uh, uh, so it, 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 what, what happened is, it, it, what happened on the beach was repeated. We occupied it for a couple of years, then the, the BLM showed up. We finally got their attention. They weren't exactly sure where we were, but they somehow find their way to me, and my partners allowed me to do all that negotiation. They also allowed me to do, the, to do all of the um, uh, negotiation to get insurance, and they kept me as far away from the money as they could. And um, uh, it, 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 so it, it, we became a government. We were responsible for everything that the city fathers of, of, of uh, Palo Alto are responsible for, uh, though we didn't maintain a jail, that was the one exception, but it's implicitly there because the federal authorities are there and they'll take you to jail if you, if you commit, uh, uh, if, if you do illegal and violent things. And uh, we have little crime, in fact, because everyone is so, there's hardly any margin for not participating and once people participate and they have a relationship to other people, uh, that, you, that it unites them in an effort, then, then crime recedes to the margins very fast. And uh, that we've established. And, and uh, it, 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 what, what, what turned out to be a, an otherworldly thing became an intensely world, worldly thing. And, and since the day we got our first permit to hold the event in the desert, we now pay the federal government, I don't know, uh, a, a few million dollars to occupy public land. Uh, uh, from, from that day to this, we were embarked on a crash course in, in uh, 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 civic architecture, uh, uh, I I economics. Uh, uh, we, 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 none of us had been to business school, to say the least. And if we had advanced this project on a, on a whiteboard as a, as a possible investment opportunity for someone. Of course, n nobody would have taken us seriously. And, uh, and also a crash course in politics. We lobby Washington now. Uh, we participate in those conversations in which deals are struck and no one ever refers to them. And uh, politics is sort of the opposite of art. Uh, it, it's all about concealment, not the, the necessity to express yourself. But they both share one thing in common, and that is the art of illusion. We become good at that, and uh, uh, and, and indeed, it, it it goes on. It includes the realms of technology, the the the, the tech community, from down this end of the peninsula, uh, it, it has been uh, uh, coming in greater numbers to Burning Man for a many years, and uh, so that's where art then meets technology. In fact, when you start to think about it, it's a little like, it is a little like, uh, it's a little like, it, it's a scene that really cooks, and I'm talking about really cooks and at some kind of scale. I, I don't want to be grandiose here, but I will be grandiose anyway. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little like Athens, it's a little like Florence, it, it's, it's, it's a world in which skills are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. uh, collaboration is second nature. Uh, a, 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 a world it, it, that, that is available to people of very modest incomes and people of, 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 it, it, with, with, that are very wealthy indeed. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a world where the normal divisions, whether they be psychological or social or, 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 or uh, it, it tend to fall away, and what people, when people ask you what you do, they're asking, what, what are you doing out here? They're not asking what you do ordinarily. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what do you immediately manifest, and, and how do you share that with others, and why should I care? And, and it turns out that, that, that there's, there's a, there's, it turns out that, that, that if you just look around you and interact with people, that you can find a readiness that suits you very well. Uh, I'll give you, a, we have a perimeter. I went out there a couple of years ago. I'd never been out there. We have a death ray. It, it's a, a giant light that'll illuminate every molecule from a mile away. We have to protect our borders, which are only no taller than this 
desk, but uh, we told that to somebody who did Glastonbury, the big festival. They have a Hadrian's wall that's about 10 feet tall, made of steel. And uh, they said, what do you use? We said, well, we use this little plastic perforated fence. And they said, really? And our people said, yeah, we got radar, which we do. And because uh, that's survival. Uh, we n need our income and depend upon it. And, uh, but I went out there and, and, and uh, got to do an intercept. It was all a lot of fun. But I went through three different people on my way to my maiden voyage in, in, into the darkness to in intercept potential interlopers in the most genial way we could. And, and, uh, and it, it, with these people, at every point, there was a lull in the conversation. All three times, there was a lull where you could hear the silence, and we were just standing looking at one another. And then all three times, the, people, the person I was talking to said, sure, it's nice to get away from people, isn't it? <laughs> and that just shows you that any temperament, any interest, any skill, it, it, it can, can, can find its niche, it, it can materialize at, at, at just like our experience in the early days in Burning Man, where it, it seemed that, that, that everything was evidence of itself, it, reality emanated out of it as in a vision. And, and artists know that experience constantly, because they work by visions, not necessarily uh, uh, complete blueprints and plans, but they, they, it, it all begins with a vision, and it serves a vision. And, and uh, what we've managed to do is, on some scale is to create visionary is to enable visionary experience uh, at, at, at something that, that uh, at a mass level, and and and, uh, and and make it authentic for every individual, give everyone an opportunity. So, um, no. but we only did that by wising up and learning how the world works, and 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 learning from what what was useful to us, and just completely reinventing other aspects of it. Um, in the Bitcoin to Burning Man book, Peter Hirschberg draws a very interesting parallel between the dynamic of top-down and bottom-up organizing. So I'm just going to read what he says. He says, Burning Man is self-organized by thousands of people and camps from all over the world. But its core directions are set by a small team of founders who curate and exercise their judgment more as Plato's philosopher king than as leaders of a democratic state. Larry, can you tell us about the evolving role of hierarchy versus collaboration and consensus that we see at Burning Man? Well, well it's a combination of both. I, I know hierarchy in some uh, uh, postmodern circles has a bad name. Uh, uh, but, but it, it, it has, the, the reason you have hierarchies, practically speaking, is, is, is they afford an elevated point of view and that accomplishes two things. You can see a farther horizon in time. So, it, so you're not surprised. You, you, can, you can think about it ahead of time and, and you can look straight down and see how things are working on the ground and how, how complex elements interrelate relate with one another. Only a hierarchical perspective can give you that. Uh, on the other hand, we create an experience, or that, that is, we create, uh, uh, we create social structures that, that conduce to experiences in, in which we're merely creating a platform and the people who participate are programming it uh, entirely on their own. We don't define radical expression as only the person who engages in it can determine its content. That's, that's in the 10 principles under self, radical self-expression. And, and so it's a hybrid between, be, 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 between reaching out to, to the world with, with the widest maximum embrace, as wide as that space feels out there, but at the same time, uh, uh, just as the man stands at the center as a prominent central landmark, which in fact the entire city uh, layout derives from, and is constantly on view as the central landmark that you might look at. And it's, and it's, it's last year was about 100 feet tall, so that people had to look up to it. Well, that's a hierarchy thing. That's where hierarchy turns into the potential for transcendence. So uh, it, uh, one shear for hierarchy. Uh, and, and only one. I'm, Come on, I'll one add shear. For half a cheer. <laughs> because there's one other, I think, important role of having hierarchical systems. 
Uh, it's when decisions need to made, be made very quickly and are mission critical. For instance, when it's matters of public health and safety. So you look at our on playa organization and there's a very wide range of, of decision making styles. Um, but when it comes to say the rangers or to emergency services, they're organized in ways that will look very much like a military or a police chain of command simply for the efficiency of decision making, right, and the accountability that comes from that. Whereas you go to decisions that are less pressing, um, we have complete consensus at some levels of the organization, right? When you have the time to really dig in and get everyone's buy-in, that works too. So that's where I see kind of the extremes of top-down versus, versus bottom-up decision making. And, and we've, we've, honestly, we've gone, we, we've struggled with this, trying to be able to steer the beast with the, the lightest possible hand, right? And, and recently, uh, Burning Man's transitioned into a nonprofit. So, Stuart, can you tell us a little bit about some of the developments and restructuring and the trends of self-organizing the global network? Well, well, sure. The, you know, the Burning Man is fundamentally still a volunteer culture, which you got to understand makes an interesting management proposition, right? When you remove all the extrinsic motivators and people can't be fired, you can't give them a raise, you can't give them a bonus, you really have to work with people's intrinsic motivation, right? We, we sometimes refer to this as uh, prodding people with a feather. So we've developed a whole sort of management style around this. Um, so even within our own organization on Playa, a lot of it has to happen that way. You have to uh, work with people to figure out what's best to be done rather than telling people what to be done. Now, as Burning Man spreads out into the world, we found a really interesting, a lot of interesting variations on how people learn from our lessons as an organizational culture. Um, two extremes, you know, there's, there's one event uh, where I would say they're following our model a little too closely. They only have a few hundred participants, but they have 26 different city departments to manage different functions, right? A little too much hierarchy. At the other extreme, um, in the Scandinavian countries, we have a, an event called uh, uh, Borderland, uh, where they're very influenced by exceptionally flat organizational thinking, the work of like Lars Koland and Unboss, uh, where they want to just blur the distinctions between, not only between uh, 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 participants and staff, but even among staff between volunteers, and they, they call everyone a co-creator. So they're going for a very kind of utopian, sort of socialist uh, way of approaching that and having absolutely no hierarchy. So we'll see how that works out, but I'm, I'm really super excited right now to see how people are experimenting with that and trying to learn from the different interpretations of it as this, uh, as this culture spreads out through the world. We, we've created a network that includes uh, uh, m many communities on five continents. Uh, moreover, there are groups that have undertaken to create immersive experiences like Black Rock City. And, um, uh, the largest of which is 10,000 and growing, but I I in all of this, and, 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 and that rate is accelerating, particularly abroad. And uh, it, it, A, it's not a franchise. Uh, it, 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 all we do is we have a network. We say if you want to belong to it, you have to, you, you, you have to practice to 10 principles by your own lights, and, 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 and if there are problems, then we'll all talk about it. And, and uh, uh, Secondly, uh, we've never mandated any kind of particular kind of governance. Now we're more than happy as the groups grow and encounter in, in scale and encounter some of the problems that we encountered 15 or even 20 years ago, we're more than happy to give people advice. It turned out that a short time back people um, uh, in the beginning no one wanted any advice from them. I'm a father and and, uh, and, and saw my son through his teenage years, and I was familiar with the attitude. And, but now that they've grown, they're very, it's like if, if your son or daughter, you know, starts a family, they might come back and ask for your opinion about something. And, and, uh, and now we, we're beginning to gear up to, to, to consult with them and help them. Uh, but we, but but what we have, what we've done is said we're not, we won't give you. It's not a franchise. We won't give you a cookie cutter plan. We're really not going to give you economic support, though in, in time to come we might. And and uh, uh, we want these communities to grow as we did. Uh, that is, we want them to grow from from roots in, in their locality, 
from where they came from. Uh, and, and we want them to learn uh, uh, their, uh, and it's, as Stuart says, it, it, there's enormous variety. What we think that will lead to is a discourse that will, that will, that will draw conclusions and, and, and tell us, everyone who's involved in this movement of ours, uh, what we are and what our culture is. The 10 principles that they've got up there, I wrote in, in, in 2001. Uh, four and um, uh, but but there's it, 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 but they aren't directives uh, they, they aren't they don't prescribe they aren't prescriptive they simply I, I wrote them in 2004 as a guide to all these communities they simply describe how people in our culture have acted and behaved they focused on action and and uh, the, you, you will not find the for those grammarians among you you will not find the imperative in them and it doesn't say you must, it doesn't say you even should. It says this is what the people, that's just what, we, what we've done. And, and, and it's organized conceptually around those notions. And, and there is a, in, in the, in the uh, mission statement of our nonprofit, it says as the sole, guide, the sole aim of the nonprofit is to stop world hunger, do any number of worthy things, is to promulgate the culture that, that Burning Man has generated, even as, if it isn't in our lineage. And, and, and it defines it usefully by the principles w and the, 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 uh, the motto is uh, nothing less than all these 10 principles combined will really do. So that suggests that there, it's an interwoven fabric, it's an organic thing, and it, every part of it is codependent on every other and, and that's how it emerged emerged from our immediate experience over a period of several years. It's, it's, a, it's a good, sane way to look at things. And, and these days I had what's called a philosophical center. Most nonprofits don't have such an office on the CPO. Uh, and it's C3PO. And, and, no, wait, just CPO. And, uh, and its motto is a quote by William James. Belief is thought at rest. So what we aspire to do is to keep talking and talking and talking after we act. Act, action's good. And then talk about real actions, that helps. And then, and then, and, and to keep talking in, in, in an almost Talmudic commentary as we go along and re-examine and re-examine the principles in action. And, and uh, we think if we can get people to do that, and it's gonna be a climb because people don't generally like to think. Well, uh, similar, similarly, recently, John Klippinger um, sat down with some of his colleagues at, on a farm, I think it was a year and a half ago, and came up with the Windhover principles. And one of them in particular is very similar to what we see um, in the 10 principles, which is um, a reference to open source collaboration and continuous innovation. So it would be interesting to hear um, a bit about how the functions of 10 principles create that, and, and Stuart, about how the, how the code and variations of the culture and translation of the wording and the intent in the 10 principles have manifested. Well, as Larry said, it's, uh, it's a way of, of leading without being prescriptive. There are no thou shalts in there, and we do not tell people how to organize their groups. We do not tell people how to organize events. We give them a value system, um, which has had pretty astonishing results so far, but we find that as the culture grows in the world, uh, some of those values are turning out to be having, uh, hitting unique challenges as they're translated into other cultures, and something that's been very fascinating to me lately. For instance, the notion of radical self-reliance. It turns out is a very American thing. You take that into other cultures, particularly the heavily socialized countries of Western Europe, and they're accustomed to the government taking care of them. I was told by some German burners that when we have a, a big storm here, people don't even go to the store and stock up on water. They assume that the water is going to keep coming out of the tap. So trying to convince people to be radically self-reliant when they have that kind of a culture is an interesting challenge. Uh, at the other end of Europe, in former Soviet bloc countries, the notion of uh, communal effort is something which has kind of negative connotations. That's what grandma and grandpa had to do on the, uh, on the collective farm, right? They're more about personal ex exuberance and showing their own independence and their own wealth rather than collaborating. So um, 
working with the groups to, to learn from them as they try to translate these ideas out is, is super fascinating. It also brings to mind the, the notion of if Burning Man is going to be a really long-term organization, right? If this is a culture that's going to last and is going to scale, um, how much do we want to control those 10 principles, right? Is it, a, a, is it, I mean, it's like a constitution, but even within constitutional scholarship, there are very divergent trains of thought. There are strict constructionists who say it's the letter of the law, period. And there are those who talk about founder's intent, right? What did they really mean when they went? And in between, there's the notion of, of amendment. So this is something we still haven't completely figured out. We haven't changed a word of those principles in the 13, no, 12 years that they've been around, but... Uh, yes, although we'll I've see. recently said, ex cathedra, that uh, there is an 11th principle and it's secret, and, 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 and everyone's entitled to that 11th principle, or a 12th or a 13th, uh, and I have my own secret principle, but I won't tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> uh, it, 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 but it, 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 it's really, it, 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 this event is so devoted to action and pragmatic measures and, 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 uh, and, 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 and yeah, very self-reliant, very American in some ways. If you look at it, those principles, they, they about evenly split between things that pertain to the individuals and things that pertain to the collective. They balance out. And, and, and you can't sanely talk about one without referring to the other. You cannot do it. We know from constructing a little civilization in the middle of nothing. And, 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 and it, it, it's actually illustrated in our history and some of the conflicts have been, without knowing it, rather philosophical in character. And the solution to those problems, though arrived at by practical means, is, it amounts to a, a, a commentary on, 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 on the values that, 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 that make uh, participants in our culture who they are. So uh, it'll be very interesting uh, if, if uh, it, it's going to take, as I say, a lot of, um, Discourse, which isn't very popular, but 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 uh, Stuart and I uh, engage in our own debates. I, I I say it's possible to make thinking sexy, and he doubts that. And uh, uh, there's got to be. I don't know if thinking every is going to be sexy, but I think it can be passionate. And I think there have been phases in the life of, of, of mankind where a, a lot of very passionate thinking was accomplished, and we tend to look at them as golden ages. And um, so let's see if, if, uh, if we can yet shine uh, uh, a little more light on a naughty world. And I think on that note, we should invite Peter Hirschberg and Michaela back up here. Uh, to talk about a little bit how they're applying some of these things and seeing them applied. Is there enough room? Hey, thank you, Jen and Larry and Stuart. Thank um, you. And stay up here because we're going to ask you some questions. Oh, okay. okay. Right, right. Right. We want to engage in a little conversation here. Okay. Um, you know, this whole bit about hierarchy um, is so fascinating because so much of the work that's being done here is about autonomous distributed systems. And as you've pointed out very eloquently, uh, you know, there's this dance between the individual and hierarchy that's completely essential to, to what you've learned in Burning Man. I kind of referred to it as an experiment before. And Michaela, when you write about holacracy, um, that same dance uh, is going on. So as, as Larry kind of described that both the necessity of hierarchy and the dance with the individual, that seems to have a real resonance to the stuff that you're writing about. And I'm interested in this because I think that informs a lot of what this group is going to be thinking about as it actually tries to turn this stuff into code. Yes, and this is indeed fascinating to see that principles such as this emerged from this sandbox, experimental sandbox, which you created with real life people. So, you know, um, I was wondering if, if I would have the opportunity to do it all over. <laughs> and that is actually what you created in the Black Rock City. So, yeah, we as mankind could redefine our principles and actually grow them from the simple human social interactions. And uh, 
in my talk I will explain a bit more about that in my presentation. Because uh, what emerged actually is a departure from the pathological hierarchies, which assume absolute power at the top, which is then you know, imposed on the parts, on the others at the bottom. While in your case, there were a combination of the power at the top, but also considering the parts as whole and respecting them, and that is the autonomy on the left side of your principles. So it's this perfect merging five for autonomy and five for cooperation, five principles. So it's, it's a perfectly balanced uh, you know, emergent system. I will speak more to this in my presentation. Um, I mean, very early on, the, the, th there's also this balance between the individual and the group. And, and of course, so much of the values, much of the values in the, in the tech world have kind of been libertarian values. This was really what happened in that, what year was it that you had the, was it 93, the big, the, 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 the tough year where, uh, Mad Max kind of thing? 96. 96. 96. 96, right. So there was this sense of extreme liberty, right? This, this thing was founded on extreme liberty. And then that was the year that you kind of realized by putting in a set of rules and, and uh, a, a, you know, kind of a bit of hierarchy, people actually had more freedom. They did, they did indeed. They gained that. I mean, this, go ahead. Uh, no, when I look back on that list of 10 principles, I could say nine of them relate to my experience as a cacophonist. Guess which one was added later? Responsibility. Civic responsibility <laughs> was one we had to learn the hard way. <laughs> yeah, well, this was, this was also what John Locke said when he said that um, liberty is not license, right? I mean, this is kind of what we went through in the Enlightenment when we sorted out kind of all these rules out. And I very much think that 96 was kind of your Enlightenment year when you kind of went through those things. Yeah, you could, or Dionysian and Apollonian, I, I, I love formulas. But, but, you know, it was essentially that. Uh, and, and it created a new awareness that it was, in fact, a community and, 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 and part of being a community required certain expressive forms of civic order. Some of them had already, already, always been there. I mean, from the very first years out in the desert when we realized that there was no one else to come and rescue us if, for instance, someone got lost or got their car stuck in the mud, that's when the Black Rock Rangers were formed as kind of a, a, a self-help force to try to keep people from dying out there in, a, in an environment where a lot of people have died over the years, right? So there were the germs of that. There was, I think that thread of civic responsibility was, was always there. Uh, it just kind of reached a, a, a peak in, I would say, fact, uh, factional looks at Burning Man as to whether it was really an anarchist playground or whether it really wanted to be something larger than that. So in addition to all these practical things of Burning Man being an experiment about how we self-organize and get the individual and the group right, uh, which, which you cover, um, Burning Man is also kind of like a contemplation of the future. It's almost like a liminal dream experience. And the themes that you have each year, in a way, call that forward. So uh, Caravansary, which was this year, and uh, the, the one before that, which was, oh, I have that Cargo here. Cult. Cargo Cult. Cargo Cult, right. And also American Dream were all kind of contemplations on material culture. Uh, uh, the Cargo Cult was about the the famous cargo cults where, where people in the South Sea saw material show up and they didn't know where it came from and it was kind of magical and in the case of Cargo Cult and Burning Man, it's like all this stuff shows up from China as part of the supply chain and like it's not exactly like we're grounded in that. This, this year Caravansary was the great souk and the idea was we could have interchange and exchange but not necessarily commercial, you know, just transaction kind of stuff. We created a marketplace, like traditional marketplaces, but in this case, you couldn't buy or sell anything. So there were very interesting negotiations that went on. Everything had to be a gift, but you couldn't haggle over it, of course, because that wouldn't make it a gift anymore. And, and I bring this up because here we are at once, like a group of people who are like writing code and, and sorting out kind of how we will instantiate this stuff in self or you know, executing contracts and money, and yet at the same time, we're kind of willfully designing a future whose values we have to get right. Uh, and Michaela, you wrote in, your, in this chapter called Reconceptualizing Social Change, Hellenics and Moral Choice, how can such insights help to change the societal gain? The current set of rules, shaped and amplified by modern technology, essentially require business models of increasing returns to scale 
a scenario that classic economics deems impossible, and contemporary rules favor single winners with world-spanning power along with the diminishing circle of people who control greater and greater proportions of our society's wealth. So um, I'd be interested, a little bit of what Burning Man tries to do is, is get us to think about this. Can you, so can you talk a little bit about like how that actually works out and the degree to which both what we do on the playa and what we kind of spread is a contemplation of this or a way of engaging people in thinking about these kinds of things? Well, it, it, for, first of all, um, it, if Burning Man is devoted to any single thing, it is to gifts. And, and, and we define gifts as has, having an unconditional value. Everybody knows that. If you give it in anticipation of a return, then it ruins the gift. And children know this. And, um, uh, and, and uh, it, 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 so we say that it has, it's unconditional, like, like, like sacred things are, are felt or thought to be unconditional. Uh, but it's led, and, 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 and indeed we wanted to spend the whole, to spend the whole apparatus of, 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 of postmodern capitalism, which is based on incessant marketing and, and increasingly and subtly coercive forms. And, um, uh, it, it, and, and, and that's fine, but that's led to a great deal of controversy. And we're still in the middle of it. We're halfway through it, maybe less than halfway through it. And, and, and it, it, then some people have thought as if they were failing, they were fleeing as consumers, fleeing the wrath to come, that it was a moneyless utopia. Well, of course it isn't a moneyless utopia. It cost $30 million to produce last year. Uh, it, we never said money was evil. If you say money is evil, then you think civilization is evil. That, that, what, what, what have even hunter-gatherers trade? It, 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 that's, of course, silly. That's immature. Uh, only consumers would imagine such a thing. <laughs> and, and so now if we're trying to figure out, we have various controversies. Is it, can, can, can species be used at the event? Well, we, we've actually done that. And we just wanted to uh, originally to, to take advertising out of the equation. And uh, now the question is, can you apply it to the world, the world in which, in which you make your living? Because if you can't apply it, if you can't apply those values to that, then I don't think it's going it, to, it's just another uh, uh, communal dream that'll age and die. And because it will have no roots in, in the material world whatsoever. So it, 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 the closest we've got yet in our thinking, uh, and if you look at our own practice, if you look at uh, what we've done laterally, we, 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 the owners, there were six of us, we were an LLC, we turned the property over, we sold the property to the nonprofit. And we each earned, I think, what was it, 46,000 a piece uh, for uh, an operation that if we'd retained the ownership of it would have made us all multimillionaires. And, uh, uh, and that's because and this could be applied to the world out there, that if you internalize these values, internalize these values, then, then, then you might go about, then we might begin to at least accept the crazy idea. I said this at, uh, uh, at that conference we were both at in Oxford, as a matter of fact, and the room went quiet. There might be such a thing as profit enough Everyone's talking about capitalism with a conscience and nobody has to, knows how to do it. And I think the way to do it is through a cultural salient that changes what people fundamentally value. And the only re way that's going to happen if things come to a crisis, and I think they are. And, and because we know the way we live in, in, in a consumer economy it, 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 it is unsustainable. And, and so that's our goal is to change that in people's life, one person at a time, one little community at a time. Uh, uh, I know I might sound like Paul of Tarsus, but that's kind of the way we're doing it. Uh, that's, a, that's a great tee up, I think, Michaela, for so much of uh, your work. So uh, I think what we're gonna do is we'll leave the stage and- uh, Can you put up the slides, please? Thank you. Oh, okay. And, and thank, thank thanks, you. I wanna just- <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, and I think that's Thank a great you. tee up for you. Yes. Thank you.